It's really delightful uh, to welcome Hal Harvey today to the director's special colloquium, special treat, I think. Um, you know, America's electric utility system is really in a midst of a transformation. We're really starting to uh, incorporate into the, into the grid renewable technologies, wind and solar. We hear a lot about it. Uh, and they're actually, when you look at the actual base price point, if you look at the installed power, they're becoming competitive. Of course, here in Illinois, that means a nickel per kilowatt hour, which is damn cheap, and that's what we pay here at the laboratory, thankfully. But, um, but uh, and Argonne in particular is at the forefront on the technology side, thinking a lot about grid, how to manage grid, how to te technology, technologically think about stochastic modeling of the grid. Um, we think about how electric vehicles can be incorporated into the grid, what it would mean to have a million, two million, ten million electric vehicles in the grid, and also creating some of the technologies, such as solar, uh, and even wind, thinking about technologies not only in creating that power, but also in managing it, things like wind prediction, et cetera. Uh, today's speaker, Hal Harvey, um, has really been a thoughtful analyst, a thoughtful spokesperson about energy systems and energy policy. And I think that's a very important piece, the policy piece, but not only the policy piece, but how we think about utility models, pricing models, the kinds of things that will make this work. It's not just inventing a nickel per kilowatt hour installed system, it's also how is that going to be incorporated and ultimately absorbed by, by, by the bigger grid. Uh, I was fortunate enough to meet Hal uh, actually a few times, but most recently at Aspen Ideas Festival this summer. So we were able to sit, I think maybe with a bottle of beer, it wasn't quite in our shorts, but it was close to that, uh, in, in the beautiful surroundings of the mountains of Aspen, uh, talking about just this problem. And I asked the question, well, you know, what good are all these policy papers? What good are all the things that you're talking about? And I think today, we'll hear a lot about what Hal's been doing to really move the needle on, on incorporating uh, solar and wind into the grid. Can you go to 5%, can you go to 10%, 20 30 even 40%? Can we have a world in which we have carbon-less production of power uh, and use of that power? So a little about Hal, um, he, he really brings many years of experience to the topic he'll tell us about today. He's currently CEO of the Energy Innovation LLC. It's an energy and environmental policy firm uh, out in California. Uh, he specializes in high quality research and his own analysis, their own group's analysis, on just four, basically four decision makers, four of those that will actually be making decisions on energy policy, decisions on utility policy, ex et cetera. Um, his team is deeply knowledgeable, as you'll see, about clean energy technologies, energy efficiency, climate science, all the, let's say, all the collateral issues around what a, an energy grid, what an energy system looks like. He's also senior fellow for energy and environment at the Paulson Institute uh, at the University of Chicago. I happen to be a facu on the faculty advisory board for that, and Hal, Hal's been participating with Hank for, for, for quite a while now, thinking not just about the U.S., but also about China, a big growing economy, and how they might grow into uh, an efficient and effective, uh, effective consumer of electricity. Um, he was founder and CEO of Climate Works Foundation Network which is a network of 13 regional uh, foundations and expert teams promoting policies to reduce the threat of climate change, carbon, et cetera. And in 1990, he founded the Energy Foundation, which is a joint initiative of six large U.S. foundations. He served as the president of the foundation since 2001. Uh, and I could go on and on, and maybe I won't. But in 2005, uh, uh, Hal served as the Rhodes Chair and Lecturer in Public Policy at Arizona State. He holds a BS and, and MS degrees in engineering from Stanford, which may explain his, his, his style, um, for those of you that are from Stanford. And, and finally, um, in his early career, apparently, he was actually building the things he talks about today, building solar, uh, solar homes and, and designing and building solar homes. So please join me in thanking uh, Hal today, joining us. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Um, it's a treat to be here. I think the, the national labs are crown jewels in America's economy and in our intellectual system and certainly crucial to solving the problems we face. Um, so Eric, I'd like to thank you for the well, warm welcome here and all the people. Um, for years, renewable energy has been thought of as a boutique fuel. Cute for hippies growing pot in the mountains of California or something like that. Um, and for years, the criticisms of renewable energy as a boutique energy source have been legitimate. Uh, it hasn't amounted to very much if you look at the scale of our power systems. Um, in recent years, and I'm going to discuss this, the prices have dropped, volumes have grown, and all of a sudden we have a high quality problem, which is integration of large fraction of renewables, and that's what I want to talk about. 
a little bit about the technology, a little bit about the system integration, and then more about the policies required to, to, to make this revolution work for us. Um, but I, just before I begin, I wanted to mention a project that we launched toward this end. Um, I'm worried that the policies that got us here so far, renewable portfolio standards, net metering, production tax credits, investment tax credits, feed-in tariffs in Europe, um, have got us up to maybe 20% penetration renewables in some jurisdictions, and that's kind of a ceiling. And we need a radically different set of policies to get us from 20% to 50% or 70%. Um, so we organized uh, something called America's Power Plan. We brought together 150 utility experts, people who ran utilities, people who ran public utilities commissions, people who are analysts in the field. We broke them into working groups on things like transmission, distribution, demand response, utility business models, and so forth. They each produced a paper on this, um, and then we assembled those and, and wrote an overview paper. And these were just published last week as a special issue of the Electricity Journal. Uh, so a lot of the findings from here came from that really intensive exercise over the last year of working with people to try to define how you build this new complex system. So I, I won't claim the insights as my own, the usual caveat, the errors are mine alone. Um, what I thought I'd do today is four things quickly. Um, talk about the opportunity, and, and by the way, if something's not clear, please interrupt uh, so we can, we can clarify as we go. The opportunity afforded by new technologies, the feasibility of this as a large-scale system instead of a bunch of boutique technologies. Can we turn the volume down just a touch? It's, I'm getting feedback up here. Um, what this means is a new energy paradigm, and finally, how do we get there? So that's the thing. I mentioned at the beginning that renewable energy is no longer a boutique technology. I've got three slides to, to talk about this. This is solar installed capacity going up in the United States and solar prices going down. Um, there's obviously cause and effect in both directions with these two trends, but they're pretty remarkable. Uh, last year alone, we put in more than three gigawatts of solar capacity in the United States. That's almost as much as we had in all history until then. The same story with wind. Um, wind prices actually went up for a while, but now they're dropping very quickly. The dark blue line is wind prices. They went up because you remember we had a run up in the price of steel and copper, and wind turbines are mostly steel and copper. They now have actually spectacular frontiers for price drops of wind. There's some new technologies in, for example, sensing when gusts are coming that allow you to feather the blades before the gust hits you which reduces your extreme design parameter, which lets you demast the tower, which reduces the costs. So there's some really exciting technologies in wind. Um, again, we've, we've got um, over 60 gigawatts of wind in America, including 12 in Texas, which is the lead. Um, so these are starting to be real numbers. Globally, the same thing is going on. If anything, it's even faster. Um, solar here in orange and wind, it's the angle of this that is really interesting. The growth rates are spectacular. Um, if you put those together, that's 400 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity. Obviously, renewable energy has a, a much lower capacity factor than coal or nuclear. It runs 20 to 30 to 40 percent of the time. But if you put this all together, even accounting for the capacity factor discount, this equals, in terms of total electrons, pretty similar to the US nuclear fleet, right? So that's a real number. And that's all been installed effectively in the last three years. So the speed of deployment, the rapidity of costs dropped, um, and, uh, and, and, and the real world experience we're getting argued, to me at least, that this is, this is a boom that we really have to pay attention to. That has all been built on the backs of two kinds of technologies, onshore wind and photovoltaic cells. There are a bunch of other technologies that are also moving along very quickly. This is a very short list. There's a lot more going on. One is solar thermal, using heliostats, these computer-controlled mirrors. They beam sun at that receiving tower, which heats up oil, which in turn, through a heat exchange, creates steam and runs steam turbines. Interesting thing about this, it costs more, there are about 400 megawatts in this power plant alone. This is Ivanpah. The interesting thing about this is because you're creating heat and heat is easy to store, you can offset your power output to match your load. So even though this may cost more per kilowatt hour, you might be delivering kilowatt hours that are in turn much more valuable, right? Because you keep your peak output along with your peak load here. 
Um, these have not gone down the cost curve. They cost more for sure than photovoltaics, but it's a volume thing. If we build more and learn more, there's no inherent reason why these have to be especially expensive, I think. Um, offshore wind. It's much more expensive to build these things out in the ocean um, for, for a lot of reasons, but the winds in the ocean blow much more consistently and steadily, so you get much higher capacity factor. Um, and here again, there's no reason you can't drive these costs down significantly. And, the, and the, the Danes, for example, are making this a national priority to become leaders in this new technology. Another interesting thing is the wind paradigms offshore tend to be dissimilar to those onshore. So you, if you put both in, you get a, some, some very important smoothing going on. On the demand side, there's a whole series of revolutions. This is a little um, village in Freiburg, Germany, which is so-called so energy plus. In other words, they create more energy than they use as a town, um, to the extent that I think they earn 4,000 euros per household per year uh, for, the, you know, for living in these slightly ugly buildings. <laughs> um, but they've done a lot of things. It's energy efficiency. Uh, it's solar as well. There's a lot of work going on with demand response. Um, I'll, tell, I'll tell one anecdote on that. Demand response is essentially highly sophisticated curtailment of demand so that you can ma make your demand profile match your supply profile. The, the old electricity paradigm is you build power plants. You build some that run 24-7 and some that run a few hours a day. And de demand is an independent variable and supply is a dependent variable. You just feed the system whatever it needs and you have a little surplus so you don't black out. The new paradigm flips it in a way because your supply becomes variable as clouds cover your photovoltaic panels, as the wind dies down. Um, and so you need other supply sources to offset those original ones. You need storage if you can get it, but you may as well manage the demand side as well. Um, so some examples of managing the demand side. You can, if you know it's gonna be a hot day, you're gonna know that a day ahead. And you know it's not gonna be a windy day, you'll know that a day ahead. And you know it's likely to be sunny. Those are all things you're gonna know a day ahead. So you can foresee um, a demand supply problem. On those days, you pre-cool your office buildings. You turn on the AC at 7 a.m. instead of 10 a.m. You run it slightly cooler through the morning, half a degree, a degree, two degrees cooler. Not noticeable for most people. Um, and then in the afternoon, you cycle your air conditioning on and off half time. And you do that with 100 buildings downtown. You've slashed your peak demand. You haven't changed the comfort envelope very much at all. And you've created very significant value for the grid because you've now got a much better balanced grid. So PJM, which is the biggest power pool in America, opened up its peak demand market to the demand side as well as the supply side. Aggregators came in with these demand response ideas and they underbid the supply ideas by 80%. Right? So there's a huge resource waiting to be tapped, which we don't even fully understand in demand response. Let me give you one other, um, one other concept, which I think you'll love. It's very cheap to move photons, right? It costs a few million bucks to put in a mile of, I mean, a very few million bucks to put in a mile of fiber optic cable. It costs about 100 times as much to put in a mile of electron moving capability in the form of transmission lines. We have, we have big data now. We have data centers all over the world. So move some photons to where you have surplus power and do your processing over there and then move, move back the results of the job. Right? Why do we have to move electrons when we can move demand around as well? So, so there are, there are, uh, there's a huge host of opportunities on the demand side that people haven't even thought about. And distributed generation, um, there's a lot of technologies there. Solar PV is obviously the biggest one, but there will be others like fuel cells that come along. Finally, let me mention the smart grid. Um, these are two words that everybody uses when they want to advertise their product, whatever their product is. So there's rampant confusion. Um, my own definition I'm going to use here, well, I'll just give a couple examples. I don't think there is a definition. Everyone's seen these Nest thermostats? This thermostat learns your patterns, knows when you get up and when you wander around the house and when you leave. It knows the thermal properties of your house in as much as it figures out how long it takes to heat or cool. And it knows the weather because it's talking to the internet. Just by knowing those things and having a little bit of optimization, it reduces your energy bill by 10 to 15%. Payback is usually well, yes, well less than a year. What this thing doesn't do is talk to your house in a meaningful way. It has two wires, one for the AC and one for the heater. 
But imagine if it understood what was going on with radiators or fans or refrigerators or lights. So this is a, this is a revolution that's a warning. It's a very different world. It's not just that the thermostat's cute, which it is, but it begins to change the way you manage your house. There's, a, there's another dozen technologies that, or more that you could call smart grid, including how you manage substations, all of which give you the ability to bend and play with and optimize the demand side of the, of the power equation as you normally do the supply side of the power equation. So let me switch gears now from opportunity to feasibility. If you stipulate that there's a lot of reasonably cheap renewable energy sources, there are more on the way that we can work on both sides of the meter, how does it add up? And I want to talk about um, some really important studies about how it adds up. Let me begin with Germany's official goals for renewable energy. Just over a decade ago, 7% renewable energy, mostly hydro, biomass. Today, this is already obsolete. One quarter of the electrons in Germany come from renewable energy sources. So, th so think on that for a sec. In about a decade, they got up to a quarter. They have the most reliable electricity system in the world, 15 minutes per year of outages. Um, they have expensive electricity, uh, and there's some interesting controversy about how much of that comes from their renewable energy program. And we just published a paper on that, which is uh, here. I'll put, we, can, we can probably post this online or something, if, if you like. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of misinformation, but Germany is a real country. It's got a real economy. They make all kinds of stuff. They live very comfortably, and they're getting one quarter of their electrons from renewable energy. Their goal is to get to 80% by 2050, and they're stair-stepping along the way. Germany's not alone. I mentioned Denmark. Denmark is a small country, but it already gets 40% of its electricity from wind alone. And they've had days when they've gotten more than 100% from wind. Um, and they don't have problems yet. Now, Denmark's 5 million people, right? It's hard to extrapolate too much from that. Um, Texas and California are leaders in America, not the only leaders, by the way. There are a number of US states, Colorado, that are already more than 20% renewables. California has already signed contracts to be 33% renewables by 2020. They've signed every contract they need to get there with a significant buffer. Um, Texas is the country's leader in wind, is coming on fast in solar. They have very different approaches, very different regulatory approaches, but if you can do it in Texas and you can do it in California, with those very different political approaches to the world, maybe it can be done in more places. Um, and here's my favorite chart of all. This shows expenditures on renewable energy with China knocking out everybody else. And look at the growth rates here. China quintupled its commitment to renewable energy that it made only two and a half years ago when it wrote the last five-year plan. So this, a year ago, renewable energy globally was a $267 billion industry. Um, so those are real numbers. So those learning curves are not over. The kind of learning we have to do is changing, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, let me mention two studies now, still sticking with the feasibility theme. The European Climate Foundation, and disclosure, I was involved with this, was a founder of that foundation, um, commissioned a study with some other analytic groups to say, could you get to 80% renewables by 2050 with the European grid? It's a very detailed analysis. It was sponsored by 12 European power companies as well. And they found that, lo and behold, you can do it. It doesn't cost that much money, but you need a lot of transmission lines. Using very different methodology, you may have heard of this study, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, um, which is a vastly inferior place, about 1,000 <laughs> miles away, um, did something called uh, renewable electricity futures. They did scenarios of high penetration renewables up to 2050, and they used an hour by hour model of the entire US electric grid to see what you could do. It's not a perfect study, and I'll talk about the weaknesses in a minute. They also concluded it was not a problem. They, you have to do some things. It's not just going to happen by magic. Um, but it, the costs are reasonable. The reliability does not suffer. It doesn't require heroic changes in technologies. It requires some new transmission, some new storage, and some other things. This is what was inside. This is their result. Now, let me emphasize, this is not a predictive result. It's a scenario. And energy modeling is filled with models that proved wrong. So I think you want to use these things as scenario testing tools. But you can see wind growing to almost 40%, solar 13%, hydro roughly level, significant biomass, which worries me a little bit, but, but there you have it. 
and squeezing out the two biggest sources of carbon dioxide emissions. Nuclear, by the way, is on a, on a secular decline in America um, because the reactors are aging and they're going to shut down. And so until we invent and then promulgate the next generation of nuclear reactors, I think it's inevitable that we see some decline here. Um, so, the, so the NREL study says you can get there. And because they looked at the entire grid and showed that it balances in 134 balancing areas hour by hour, they have some confidence. Now, they also said you need more transmission, although I just learned today that apparently the way you optimize the transmission system is by turning off transmission lines. I have to talk to Gunther some more about to try to understand that well. Um, but um, they did a scenario where they reduced the amount of transmission by 70%, and they still were able to push 30 or push 80% renewables to the grid. Some of the, um, oh, so, some of the conclusions, you need geographical diversity. The variability in, renewal, in most renewable energy sources drops a lot as your area covered expands. It's, if it's windy in Texas, it's not windy in Montana or vice versa, for example. And then you use a variety of sources. So, so, so biomass was important. Biomass, geothermal, hydro, and storage are dispatchable renewable sources. Um, wind and solar are not dispatchable. If you blend them and you have large geographies over which to optimize, you can have a much smoother curve than if you constrain it. Um, so that requires, obviously, more transmission and dispatch. This is a, there's a pretty cool simulation, if you haven't seen it on the web, where they show how different sources grow and change on the way to 2050, between now and 2050. Um, I call this the refrigerator mold chart. So. They might, they might updo their, update their graphics a little bit. Um, th there are some limitations to this study, and here are a few of them. It doesn't get into policy. This was, by the way, one of the motivations of our, our work called America's Power Plan. Um, it's, it's zonal, not nodal, and a, any power systems person is going to insist on a nodal study because you have to know what's happening at every point. Um, they don't do much on distributed generation, and I think distributed generation is going to grow far faster than they assumed, and that creates new complexities, new problems, as well as new opportunities. They project, I think it's over 100 gigawatts of storage. That's a big number. Um, and, and then there, there's some other issues. So it's not a perfect study, but it's, I think it's the best one that's ever been done. And it comes up with a very optimistic result. So if the technology is getting cheap, and ubiquitous, and the growth rates are high, and if smart people think you can get up to 80% renewables without crashing the system, the question becomes how? What do, you get? How, what, what do you have to do to make this happen? What kinds of policies are required? Uh, what kinds of dispatch are required? I want to start this off with this slide from Germany, uh, Germany and the US. This shows real world installed prices of solar systems in Germany, in the yellow, and in the US in blue. And what you're seeing is with the same technology at the same time, a factor two difference in installed PV. So if somebody came along and said, I can cut your price in half on one of the most important technologies you're interested in, you'd pay attention. None of this is done in the labs. This is permitting. It's interconnection standards. It's basically how fast and how easy it is to put these things on a roof. When you want to put a solar system on your roof in America, you've got about a 180-day wait. You have to go to the town council. You have to go to the homeowners association. You have to deal with the utility. You might need a planning and zoning variance. You're going to have to bring in the fire insurance people. This is to put some glass on your roof, right? It's, it's a little bit crazy. I went through it myself, and I, I got a company to do all the work for me, but it still took a long time. In Germany, it's, it takes a few days. Right? So w this is not a technology advantage. This is a systems advantage. And this is one of the things, one of the things I'm going to talk about a little bit. I call this investment grade policies. If you put the right kind of policies in place, the investors will get behind them, and the systems will clear. And if you don't, the systems clog up. And we've seen that again and again. Um, the, the, this chart shows, it's, it's too complicated to talk about much, but it shows the range of costs from one study for some fossil technologies and non-fossil technologies. Um, and if you use gas combined cycle as a benchmark, it's about seven cents a kilowatt hour. Fully, that's uh, capital and fuel together. And you can see that energy efficiency is cheaper, that wind's in the money, and then others are a little bit out of the money or maybe in the money, including solar PV. I put this chart up for one, for one reason. First of all, I don't believe these numbers. They, they vary a lot, district by district, year by year 
and so on. But what they argue to me is it's a social choice whether you go to a low carbon future or a high carbon future. It's less and less an economic choice. It's more and more a social choice. And the way we express social choices is with policy. So what kinds of policies are going to create that? Hmm, I forgot. I have, to, I have to do this first. What kinds of policies do we need? The, the, but before I do that, I have to mention something about the, the, the problem with, our, with, with all of this. And this is a big problem. Um, this is a complex chart, but everyone here has a PhD, so I'll go quickly. Um, that blue line is load in California over a typical 24-hour day. And you can see it peaks after the sun goes down uh, when people turn on their AC to cool off their houses at the end of the day. Um, when you put in wind in this green line and solar in this yellow line, you, create the net, you leave behind the net load that you have to produce with your conventional generators. And the net load is this red line. OK, so now you're a power system, you're a utility, or you're the California independent system operator, and you have to make that red line happen. Because the wind's going to do what it does, the sun's going to do what it does, and your consumers are going to do what they do. So this turns out to be very hard to do. Why? Because around 6 in the morning, you have to turn on 8,000 megawatts of generators. You run them for an hour, and you shut them all down. Leave them off all day. And then, 4 in the afternoon, you have to turn on, did I, did I, I, I uh, yeah, so it's, there's two scales here, which is always confusing to me. Um, so you have to go from 26,000 to, you have to turn on 18,000 megawatts of generators, again, and run them for a couple hours and shut them down. We did not design our power system to do that. Nuclear power plants don't like to be turned on and off. Coal-fired power plants don't like to be turned on and off. Efficient gas turbines, combined cycle turbines, don't like to be turned on and off. Inefficient gas turbines are happy to be turned on and off, but that's not a very good idea, is it? Um, and so... And so we have this problem. In California, they call this the duck problem because this thing looks vaguely like a duck, um, with the emphasis on vague. <laughs> so, so what technologies fix the duck, and what policies cause those technologies to be deployed? The first thing I have to say is emphatically, today's policies don't fix the duck. Okay? So one thing you want to do is you want to eliminate the duck's head. right? You want to chop off as much as you can of that right there. And the best way to do that seems to be demand response. It's what I call pre-cooling your buildings, moving data around, and so on. If you can knock off a couple thousand megawatts of power right there, you've come a long way to solving your problem. Um, and so, so this is a demand response job. But then you want to you learn how to deal with that steepness a little bit. So let's put some solar thermal in. And so your solar curve, instead of dropping like that, has a gradual ramp like that. That helps with everything. Use ordinary energy efficiency. That's a good thing, no matter what. It brings the whole thing down. So you have excess, you have surplus capacity in the grid, and you have surplus capacity on the supply side. And finally, you need to open up a, a system, either by compelling your utilities to do it, or by creating a market for fast ramping power supplies. Could be storage, or could be super efficient gas plants to turn on and off quickly, which now exist. Both Siemens and GE have created these incredibly efficient fast ramping natural gas power plants so that you have something that can turn on, run for a couple hours, and turn off without destroying its thermal efficiency. You're not going to get that capacity in an energy-only market. If you're only paying for kilowatt hours, nobody's going to spend that billion dollars to build that power plant. You have to pay them extra for something that turns on quick and turns off quick. right? So this gets into market design very quickly. And so, and, uh, 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 let me quickly walk through the list of the ways you handle variability. So transmission lines help a lot, too. You will not see the same curve with the same coincidence in Oregon, because it's not going to get hot in Oregon or in Washington. right? So they can ship power down when we most need it. Demand response, I mentioned. Storage technologies, self-evident. Um, and then system optimization, learning how to turn everything on and off quickly. So I think I've gone through these, even though I forgot to push the button. Um, so let me now finally turn to the policies that caused this to happen. Um, most utilities in America are rewarded for selling kilowatt hours. They're not rewarded for helping on the customer side of the meter. A huge fraction of the opportunity is on the customer side of the meter. California buildings now use 80% less energy, new buildings, corrected for size and corrected for temperature than they did 20 years ago. Right? The, the opportunities on the demand side of the meter are enormous. California spends far more. California's utilities 
spend far more on energy efficiency than the U.S. Department of Energy spends on energy efficiency, far more. The reason they do it is because the Public Utilities Commission said to them, you guys can make money on the customer side of the meter. In fact, we don't care where you work, customer side of the meter or your side of the meter, as long as you're providing the lowest cost electricity services. Electricity services are light and comfort, not kilowatt hours. So now you have this apparatus with massive cash flow, existing public oversight, 100% information on customers' energy use and billing apparatus, um, cars, I mean, you know, trucks and workers in every district, and their job is to make houses more efficient, and they can make money on it. So they do it. So we need to unleash that. There are now 11 states that have done this. Uh, we should make that 50. The second is renewable portfolio standards. This has what's driven the revolution in America so far. Those prices for wind especially, and to some extent solar, came down because we asked utilities to produce increasing fractions of their renewable energy from solar. Uh, 30 states have renewable portfolio standards. We're starting to hit the ceiling on all those, and I think they need to be incremented again. The good news is because renewable energy costs have dropped a lot, this is an economically painless thing to do, but it's not a politically painless thing to do because incumbent producers don't love this. Um, a third element, and this is controversial amongst environmentalists, is to change net metering. Um, net metering is the idea that you can spin the meter backwards when you're producing solar on your own home. Um, and it makes intuitive sense to pretty much everybody, but it gets a little weird when a lot of customers start to do it. And I'll, I'll give my example, my house as an example. Um, California has um, electric rates that are very low for poor customers for small, or for small volumes of electricity. It's called a lifeline rate. And they go up a little bit if you use a little more electricity. But if you start using a lot of electricity, your rates are 28 cents a kilowatt hour. But you pay five cents in Illinois, by contrast. So I never used much electricity, so I didn't worry about this. But when I got my PV system on my roof, I could spin the meter backwards. So now, at the, I, and, I, and it's big enough that I get into that high rate very quickly. It's time of use rate. So I'm now being paid 28 cents a kilowatt hour to spin the meter backwards. And then at night, when I use my lights, I, get, I, I buy for it about seven cents a kilowatt hour. So my energy bill last month was minus $82. So the utility paid me $82 for the privilege of running wires to my house, giving me electricity at night, taking what I didn't need in the day. Now that makes sense if you have absolutely perfect rate, two-way rate design, right? It doesn't make sense um, increasingly in California. I'm getting too good a deal is the bottom line. I'll take it for now. Um, so, so, so I say repair net metering. Yeah. Yes. Why is it controversial to environmentalists? Some people love net metering because it causes a lot of solar to be built, and California is building a lot of solar. Um, some are worried that it creates in, uh, intolerable price distortions in the market. If you own your own house, which means you're an owner, not a renter, and you're rich enough to finance this thing. You can, you can benefit from it. If you're a renter or you can't afford the solar panels, you're still paying for it because you're a utility customer, right? So there's, a, there's an equity problem. It's okay at one or 2% penetration because you're just goosing the market. But in my opinion, when you really want this to roll out, you need something that's more equitable, more durable. Does that make sense? So why is it controversial for me to say that? Because the environmentalists have historically seen this as manna from heaven, and it is, right? Or from your, your local utility. It, it got it going. But sometimes the things that get an industry going are not the things you want to continue with. The feed-in tariff in Germany, which set a very high fixed price for solar, stayed too high for too long, and so they're paying too much for solar, right? It's a bad idea to overpay for things. Japan just established a feed-in tariff at a shoot-me-in-the-head price of 53 cents a kilowatt hour. So they're getting a lot of solar, but people are making way too much money off of that. It's not a sustainable policy. So I'm a big advocate of what I call price-finding policies. So you should auction off your subsidy. You can't do it on a per-household basis. But you can go to a utility. A utility can say, OK, I have a renewable portfolio standard, or a state can do this. I want to put in uh, 1,000 megawatts of solar. And I'm going to let you bid for a subsidy. Right? You sell your electrons on the market. You have your costs. You know how much money you need as a subsidy. 
and the lowest bid wins the subsidy. And then you run the auction again. It's, it's a long-term contract for a relatively modest volume. You run it again and again next, each year. It's, it's a price-finding policy, and the advantage of that is you don't waste social, you don't waste the public money. You also drive prices down very fast. So, is that, is that good? Um, the next one is supply and demand compete as equals. I think I've covered this with the, with the PJM example. Um, if you let demand side bid into markets, you will be surprised at what you get. I, I predict pretty dramatic changes here. Um, <clears throat> this we talked about, this fast ramping, or value of the ability to turn things on and off. And I'll give you an example from Texas. Texas has the most liberalized electricity market in America. All electricity is sold on an hour ahead market, right? And it's all energy that's sold. It's not power capacity. And the consequence of that is the only thing people build down there are gas and wind, because that's low capital costs, right? Relatively low capital costs. So Texas is now facing brownouts, because nobody's building stuff that runs a few hours a year. If you only make your money by selling energy, then why would you sell power, right? Why would you sell the ability to dispatch? So we're arguing, or we're, in conversation, I should say, with the Texas authorities to say what you need to do is open up another market for, for a special kind of capacity. It's, it's, it's power that's guaranteed to turn on and guaranteed to turn on quickly. I don't think it's gonna be a big economic number compared to the energy market, but it's a crucial one. It's, it's a part you need. Um, uh, we had a great presentation over lunch with, from, from Gunther and he talked about flexibility services. It turns out there's a variety of things you need to do to keep a, a, a power system stable, so you may as well pay for it, right? You can't just, there's no more default utility that's gonna do everything you want in a, in a deregulated world. And increasingly, there's nobody in charge of optimizing the system, which is emphatically what you need in a world with lots of renewable energy and with this whole variety of technologies on both the supply side and the demand side. So you have to build either markets or mandates for, for flexibility services. Um, Optimizing the grid, you'll recall both the NREL study and the, and the European study said we need more grid. Um, optimize is a better word than more, um, as, as again, as I'm learning even as recently as today. There's nobody in charge of doing this in the United States. The FERC uh, tries to prevent discrimination and encourages states to do a lot of grid planning, and then there are power pools and there are power areas, but this is kind of a, a little bit of a leftover of deregulation. Um, Investment grade financing, again, is a grossly neglected area. Again, environmentalists focused on renewable portfolio standards, which require utilities to purchase a certain fraction of their electrons from renewable sources. But to make this an investable product, investable project, you need the ability to site your thing, you need a, an interconnection standard, you need the ability to hook up to a transmission line, you need the ability to um, make sure the utility will sign a contract in a reasonable amount of time. Um, if you don't have those other qualities, you don't have a business proposition. Or else you have a business proposition that carries a very substantial risk premium. And I think there's probably between 30% and 50% discount available if we move to our, what I would call investment grade policies, where you handle all that stuff. And one of them is citing, and this is the end of my, my show here. There was a, a guy in Germany I met, and I was talking about transmission lines. He was from GE Germany. And he says, you know, in Germany, there's a resistance group for every kilometer of transmission line. Um, and we've all seen that, right? And, and the problem is if you, if you try to put a wind facility or a coal-fired power plant or a nuclear plant or a transmission group where it shouldn't be, you're gonna hit resistance. So what I've been an advocate for is, is basically pre-zoning some areas for development and forbidding others. So if you have wilderness area, if you have water issues, if you have a scenic corridor, um, if you have conflicts, you put a red, you box them out in red, and you just don't even discuss it. And conversely, if there's an obvious place to put a transmission line along a railroad or something like that, you green light it. You guarantee a 30-day permit for anybody who wants to do it. Um, let's just take that uncertainty off the table, both sides. So, if you, if you look at this, we put up eight policies here. Most of these will have to be pursued by public utilities commissions. There are 50 of them, plus FERC has an important role. Um, they won't all be pursued at the same time by all the commissions, but I think there will be 
around a dozen states that will get out in front. Um, and I guess what I'm saying is we need them, them to do that pretty quickly. We need to do them with a little bit of courage, not craziness. Um, if we do that, we'll start to see a number of jurisdictions moving from 20% renewables to 40 or 50% renewables. And that's, I would submit to you, as the challenge between now and 2030, is to be moving easily towards 40% renewables or beyond. So I will conclude with that and be happy for questions. You, you focused on the states and the PUCs and the utilities, and I have to ask the question, what can the feds do, if anything? Open up for yeah, business. Yeah. Um, that would be a good start. You, you, you guys wouldn't notice, I know, but um, no, the, 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 the federal government has an, has an important role. So one of the most interesting charts you can look at, and I'm sure you've seen this, is wind energy builds in America. They look like jack-o'-lantern teeth. Right? And then the production tax credit in America. We let it expire every two years. We stop construction, and then we start it up. So it's just, it's just stupid from every direction except for one, and I'll explain the one it's smart from. If you're a wind developer, you have to hustle and waste money in the good years and then shut everything off in the bad years. If you're a windmill producer, you have a book of orders that you can't meet and, a, and then no book of orders, right? The cynical view of why it makes sense is in order to get that credit re-established, the wind companies have to make lots of donations, which is a two-year cycle, to the members of Congress. Now, that's maybe a little too cynical. But the policy is an absolutely terrible policy, on again, off again. Um, investment tax credits, dumb policy, too, because you're not rewarding performance. Performance is kilowatt hours. Investment is an input. We should reward outputs. That's a basic policy principle. Right? And the other thing about the investment tax credits is they're not fungible. Right? You can only use a tax credit if you need a tax credit, and there's a very limited market for it. So people have to conjure up these ridiculous corporate schemes to have losses so that they can, or to have taxes so that they can use the credits. Well, most companies in the wind business don't have to pay a lot of taxes because they're startups. So the first thing you do is you take the policies that you have on which you're spending money on which you're expending political capital, and you rationalize them, and you get a two-to-one benefit for sure. Um, thinking more broadly, there, 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 are, there are two or three really important frontiers. The Environmental Protection Agency is required under the Clean Air Act amendments to regulate carbon dioxide, and that's been affirmed by the Supreme Court. And the president has asked them to do this in two phases. The first is carbon dioxide standards for new power plants, and the second is carbon dioxide standards for existing power plants. The new power plant standards are out in draft form, and they essentially prohibit an unmitigated coal-fired power plant. In other words, you have to sequester some fraction of your carbon. There's a number of design ideas for the existing power plant fleet. As you can imagine, it's much more controversial. Nobody's trying to build new coal anyway right now in the country because gas is so cheap. Um, but one way to, one intelligent way, in my opinion, to deal with existing power plants is to let the states create a portfolio. And they say, here's my CO2 per kilowatt hour blended, right? Across all my power sources. I'm gonna stair step it down at a pretty good level. And I'm allowed in stair stepping it down to shut down coal, to sequester coal, to sequester gas, to deploy renewables or to deploy efficiency. As long as I'm following that down. That's a performance-based standards. It's set by state. You're not penalizing people for where they start. You're giving, and you're creating a long-term signal, right? Those are all, crucial policy design characteristics. So I think um, the EPA has a fantastic opportunity to allow that to happen. And I predict if they go that route, the technology will make this a very cheap, very cheap approach. So. Hi. So uh, I infer from your answer to that question that um, you're not a fan of monetizing the social cost of carbon, which is something else that the feds mm. could do here. No, no, I, I um, l l let, me, let me say a little bit about that. Um, I'm very much a fan of monetizing the social cost of carbon. Um, and you can do that with a shadow price, which the federal government's doing, and you can do it with an explicit price, which we're not doing. Um, and everybody understands the, the reasons for pricing carbon, internalized externality, let the market find the solution, and so forth. 
So I'm strongly in favor of it, but it, I, ha it has strong, I have strong caveats about it, which is not shared with everybody down at the Chicago School, um, as follows. There are some sectors of the economy that are almost impervious to energy price signals. So you take buildings. It's extremely rare that the person who designed a building or the person who built a building actually pays the energy bills in the building, right? There's a, what they call a principal agent problem. There's a disconnect between the decision maker and the decision taker, which is the utility payer. If you're a renter, there's no chance you're gonna rehab every, you know, put insulation in the roof of your apartment building or, or, or something like that. Um, there are some other sectors where there's no principal agent problem, but energy is in the noise, and so it just doesn't get dealt with. Uh, and appliances are a great example of that. Nobody chooses a refrigerator, except people with PhDs working at Argonne National Lab, based on the, based on the energy label, right? They want butter or dispenser or whatever, right, ice. So a, building codes are an incredibly effective way of driving, ener, driving down energy consumption in buildings. The, reason, the main reason California's dropped its energy consumption by 80% is it's got the best building code in the world. And I can explain why it's the best. Um, refrigerators have also dropped their energy consumption by 80%. Nobody noticed. Reliability went up, price went down, size got bigger, energy dropped by 80%. So there are some realms in which a performance standard appropriately designed to be dynamic with respect to technology is better than a price signal, but in any event, they're highly complementary. They, they go beautifully together. So I would say carbon pricing is incredibly important, but it's not a panacea. Uh, so if you think net metering is too good a deal for the consumer, what do you think would be a, a, a fair deal? So there, there, there are two approaches to take, and they, they're in some ways symmetrical. One is you can fix net metering. So if, you know, net metering makes sense as long as you've set the rates perfectly, right? So if I wasn't paid 28 cents a kilowatt hour to run the meter backwards, but was paid 12 cents, it would probably be a pretty fair deal. So it's not that net metering is the problem, it's that the underlying rates were misset. I think the best way to do it is, is taking that concept, you do what they call a value of solar and a cost of, sol a, a cost of solar um, analysis. So value of solar, there's energy displaced, there's capacity displaced, there might be peak displaced, you might help with system stability, you might prevent some upgrade of the distribution system. By the way, it's highly localized. Your value of solar is highly localized. And then the costs of solar are you have to provide backup, you have to maintain the transmission and distribution system, you might get some weird power fluctuations, and you just tote it up and you give the guy the price signal. But you gotta give him a long-term price signal, right? You can't say, mm, this year it's worth $500 to you and next year it's worth 150 because they're making a 30-year investment. So you create a transparent methodology, you lay out all the factors, you run it every year, and then you give somebody a rate that lasts for five years or seven years or something based, based on that rate. So, Howie, you talked a lot about policy, and of course all this, you know, all the technology you've talked about is factors of two, and if we could give you a factor of two, that would be great. Are there, uh, aside from uh, maybe a DNA modification of Congress to get them to follow your policy, are there, are there technical game changers that you could imagine would really transform, you know, we're all scientists here, technology folks, and is there, a, are there technology game changers, or, or is this really just an engineering game and a policy game now? I think there are profound technology game changers. Um, you know, most of the work we have done in t as technologists in this country has been about device technology. The PV cell, the motor, or the motor controller, or the automobile, even within the automobile, it's the device inside it, it's the engine or maybe the transmission. And I think we need more emphasis on the system in which it operates. And there's this, you know, the, the old motors, you turn them on and then you throttle the pipe, right? And the equivalent of that is you put a brick on the gas pedal and then you ride the brake to adjust your speed. And the new way is you determine the flow rate you want and you have a valve that's really a motor controller. Um, you can have little pipes, with high friction surfaces or big pipes with low friction surfaces. You can have 90 degree bends or 245s. You can reduce pumping costs, which turns out to be an enormous load in America, probably by a factor of two. But that's the system design thing, which we don't. Nobody does buildings optimization. There is no profession. There's no business 
that does buildings optimization. When you build a building, you have 20 systems cobbled together. One guy does the foundation, somebody else puts up the suds, somebody else puts up the insulation, somebody else takes a saw to that so they can put some wire in, then another saw to put some plumbing in, and then, and then they put some sheetrock on. Every one of those is a different vendor. Often they're different contractors. And you end up with a wall, but is it an optimized wall? Not by any means. This, the, you know, our entire built stock is essentially without technology. So I would say system technology, cars, light weighting, I think is gonna be a mega trend. There's no reason a car should weigh 4,000 pounds. And that's what the average car in America weighs. You can do a lot with the transmission and the tires and the engines to make it more fuel efficient, but you still have an inertial mass that you're dragging around that you don't need to be dragging around. So I think advanced materials are gonna be an absolute game changer. Um, so I, but I guess I would think it's more complex, but system optimization is, is where it's at. When we talk about um, natural gas, are we being a little oversimplified? I mean, we, saw, we went up from 15 down to under two, now we're up, I don't know if we're at four, that we have a huge increase in consumption, whether people think about transportation, you know, we're reestablishing a chemical industry, yet we're, sh we're capping in, we're not doing no more drilling because all the drilling is either looking for natural gas liquids or for crude oil. Are we gonna see a big snapback price, you know, in price and really not have this big growth in power from natural gas? So it reminds me, uh, I don't know if you know Lynn Orr, he's a professor of, at Stanford, he's a geology guy and an energy guy. And he says, well, people always ask me what the price of oil is gonna be, and I tell them the following. It's gonna go up and it's gonna go down, but I can't tell you which order or how far or when, right? <laughs> and, and this is apparently how we, I mean, you know, nat natural gas prices have been in a total seesaw, and they're in another one still. Um, a lot of people are arguing there's a natural stable point now of four or five bucks. I kind of believe it. Um, <laughs> until it changes. So, so what's happened, by the way, natural gas rig counts are now down by 65% from their peak just a couple of years ago. You know, fracking was discovered, fracking makes it possible to produce a lot of gas at about four bucks. So there's a long-term um, price ceiling maybe of four bucks or five bucks. That'll listen, there will be episodic excursions beyond that, and they'll be very costly to some people. But because gas and oil have an almost threefold difference in their per BTU value, with oil being much higher, um, and since fracking works for oil as well, all those rigs that could be diverted to oil, and all those formations that have oil in them are the ones that are, are going full speed right now. And so most fracking in America is in search of oil. That's the big boom in the Bakken and other places. And then there's some kinds of gas formations have a lot of associated liquids which you can use and you can refine and use as substitutes for other petroleum products. So I, I don't think gas is, natural gas is gonna be a big transportation fuel. Um, I do think it already is and will grow as a manufacturing feedstock and a fertilizer feedstock and so on. I think there's a huge market for that. I think we're gonna have cheap, pretty cheap heating for a long time in America. Um, what worries me about natural gas, honestly, is how much of it leaks, which we don't know. And it does, if 3% of gas leaks, it's as bad as coal. Um, and how much leaks? No one knows. We're starting to study it, but we really don't know. Um, I think the siting and water standards for natural gas have been between bad and abysmal, depending on where you are. They need to think about that pretty hard. So I guess what I'm saying is gas's own worst enemy is gas practices. And that the only way gas is really a big part of America's energy future is if the gas industry gets its act together with respect to siting, water, casing standards, and leaks. Is that, did I come close to answering your question? Well, much of what you talked about relies heavily, uh, relies heavily on smart grid technology. So I'd like to, smart grid. Yeah. yeah. So I'd like to voice some concerns about that, uh, not to, no, no, to uh, this all this, but just that it has to be addressed for acceptance. One is robustness of the system against mm -hmm. just horrible crashes, computer bugs and such, or sabotage. 